about pest management will tell you how much and what to spray on them in order to kill these things. Now I recognize that insecticides are a really important component of producing crops and managing pests, but I don't believe that these are the first line of defense against these insects. I believe that these are the last resort against insect pests. In part because we need to realize that insects are some of the most diverse animals on the planet. Sure, there are about 3,000, 3,500 pests of humans. They eat our food, they eat our, our uh, uh, they transmit diseases, they destroy our forests, they, uh, they, they get in people's hair uh, and make children wake in the night. But for every one of these insects that are pests, there are 3,000 other insect species out there that are either really beneficial to us or that we simply don't get. Most of these things we haven't even put a name on yet, but people are, let's squish them, let's squish them, let's kill those sons of guns. No, 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 no. We need to understand what the 3,000 insects are doing out there that are doing good things for us rather than focusing on just the ones that are causing us a headache. So when I'm talking about some of the services that insects provide, there are numerous. These things are the basis of complex food webs. Paul just hinted at this. I mean, do you like, do you like hunting and fishing? If you do, think an insect. Because that is the support, that is the basis of all of our wildlife, or much of it, that is out there that we are able to uh, tap into as humans. I dare say that the Western culture, the European culture, is the only one on Earth that does not rely on insects as a major component of their diet. Jay Fuhrer said, so, or put up a nice slide of the conversion efficiencies of uh, grain to livestock. Insects kick all of those other animals' asses. I mean, uh, uh, it's like less than a pound of grain is transmitted into a pound of insects. These things have more in nutrition in them if only we would figure out a nice cookbook. In fact, there are some, and I can transmit those to you guys if you'd like. Uh, these uh, insects are really important decomposers. These things are extremely important in returning nutrients to the ground. Uh, things like breaking down dung from animals and returning those nutrients that large mammals take out of the environment. Uh, also breaking down plant material. These are sort of the first step in the process of vegetation decomposition. Insects regulate herbivores. A lot of the pests that we're experiencing in crops are regulated by predators and parasitic wasps that are out there in the environment. This is what I really like to study. They also shape the dispersion and density of plant communities. Insects are incredibly important in shaping the plant communities that we interact with, including weed communities. And these Last two, oh, there's also pollinators back there. There's a nice uh, thing that NRCS is pushing. Uh, we need to also, yeah, well, we'll t I'll talk with you more about trying to get some of these other beneficial traits uh, into the, the line of sights of NRCS as well. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on these last two services that insects provide to, to uh, human, humankind. All right, so diversity, we think of insect diversity as being, oh, well, that's in the rainforest, right? Well, that's true to a point, but we also need to realize that agroecosystems are a really, really important component or a source of insect diversity within the landscape. So uh, Robert Krolwich, you guys have this in your soil biology se uh, section of your, of your, um, of your folders did a, a really important uh, observation that we are eliminating a lot of our biodiversity from our cornfields. We actually have hard numbers on exactly what kind of diversity we have in our cornfields and the situation is maybe not as dire 
as what he was hinting at in his paper, but the point being that we have eliminated a lot of the diversity from our agroecosystems that's normally found in native grasslands or prairies. We wanted to figure out exactly what kind of insect diversity actually exists in cornfields because the insects that are out there are dictating which ones need to be managed, right? So we went throughout eastern South Dakota over two years and sampled 53 farms. Now these farms, we had a couple of uh, characters that these farms had to, or characteristics that these farms had to have. They had to be at least 10 acres in size. We were really targeting the sort of the non-BT refuges back when there was non-BT refuges. Um, and we wanted no insecticides to be used because obviously this would reduce the, uh, the overall number of insect species that we would find. This was almost impossible. There were almost all of the cornfields that we were experiencing had seed treatments on them. There, so we said, well, minimal insecticide use then. Hopefully a lot of those seed treatments would be gone by the time we sampled our, 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 uh, our insect communities. Some still had no insecticides though. What did we find? We found over a hundred insect species, and I put quotations because it was, these were, uh, there was about 107 creepy crawlies, things with lots of legs or no legs at all. Uh, just in the soil canopy, or I'm sorry, just in the, in the, in the crop canopy. So we cut the plants from uh, at the soil surface and we brought them out of the field and then we looked at everything from the top to the bottom of those plants. Um, counted it up, tried to identify it as best as we could. 107 insect species were found just in this part of the corn, in, the, in this part of the, uh, of the ecosystem. Of these, only seven were primary pests. Things like European corn borer, things like corn rootworms, things like aphids. But what was really interesting is that maybe one or two out of, of these fields actually had pests at economically damaging levels. Mind you, these, these fields saw little or no insecticide use, but yet they still had no inse in insect pests out there, very seldom. About 13% of these actually eat the corn plant in some way or another. They're herbivores, but they're not really hurting the corn plant, so it's not something that farmers actually need to manage. What's interesting is that given that these were not at economically damaging levels, it really begs the question, why the hell are we pumping so much insecticides and paying so much money in seed technology fees for BT to control a pest that doesn't exist there? But what was really interesting to me, the natural enemy populations. In these fields, we found on these plants between four and five predators per plant. Predators being things like little minute pirate bugs, things like spiders, things like lady beetles, lace wings. This translates to 137 to 160,000 predators per acre just in the corn canopy. That's all well and good, John. We're talking soil here, right, buddy? Uh, you're at the wrong show. Well, okay. We've got data on that too, although we, it's a lot more difficult to assess what's going on in the soil sampling these things. It's a hell of a lot of work. Uh, so we've got one cornfield that I've really described the living heck out of. We use soil cores. We've discovered 63 species. On the soil surface, we'd get on our hands and knees and look in quadrats, trying to get actual densities of these things. 86 just predator species now, guys. Pitfall traps, you dig a hole in the ground, things fall in it. 85 more species. Easily in the soil of this one cornfield, we found more than 200 species. Add to this the 100 species in the foliar population. In one cornfield, you can easily find 200, 300 species of insects. Absolutely amazing just how much diversity out there. It's all well and good. What are these, what's all this diversity doing? What services does it provide? Well, I've only got 
what, 45 minutes or so to talk about that today, so I'm not going to go into everything that it's doing. I'm going to focus on two things, pest management related, because a lot of our key pests in agriculture have life stages that are somehow associated with the soil, right? Insects, like the corn rootworm, have a subterranean life stage. They live under the ground. Weed seeds are a really important component of the weeds population dynamics that live in the soil. These soil insects are a really important source of management for trying to control these pests in agriculture. All right. Step one, insect pest management, or example one. Corn rootworms. Many of you have heard the name. As the name suggests, these corn, uh, this is a beetle pest. The adults lay their eggs in the fall. Right now, if you, some of you guys are producing corn, you have corn rootworm eggs living in your soil, anxiously awaiting the spring when they can hatch and eat the roots of your corn plants, chewing them up making the corn plants fall over directly and making it very difficult to harvest. Um, the adults then uh, 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 come out of the soil, they feed on the tassels, making it more difficult for uh, kernel fill on the plants. This thing is, given that it is the most important pest of corn, and that corn is the most important pet crop in the world, corn rootworms have become the most, or the, the most expensive crop pest in the world to control. We've recognized this thing for a hundred years. Millions of research dollars have been spent on researching how to control this pest. And the one thing that we have learned is that Corn rootworms, whatever we decide to throw at them, chew it up, spit it back at us, and then flip us the bird. <laughs> this all started with soil insecticides. Corn rootworms came on in the early 70s or so. Um, we started spraying insecticides on them uh, that never really worked. I mean, there was maybe 50% control because the insecticides never really came in contact with the pest. Oh, but then the pest became resistant to the insecticides anyway, so that technology got shot out of the water. Along comes crop rotation. Brilliant idea. It takes advantage of the biology of the pest, right? You plant soybeans after corn, those corn rootworm eggs that are anxiously awaiting the corn crop in your fields right now hatch into soybean fields. They try to eat the soybean roots, they die. Well, about 15 years ago, corn rootworms have, have figured out not one way, but two ways to get around crop rotation. Rather than laying their eggs in corn plants, they lay their eggs in soybean fields so that they can fire, so that they can hatch in the next phase of the, of the crop sequence back into the corn fields again. Not only that, but another population evolved resistance because instead of overwintering one year, they now overwinter two years. They bypass the soybean phase of the rotation. Therefore, now we have rootworm, or rotation resistant rootworms that are taking over the country. But don't worry about it, everybody. Stop thinking right now. Don't use your heads here because guess what? The solution to the problem is all in the bag. We have BT corn. BT corn kills corn rootworms. This corn seed also has insecticides on it. Insecticides kills corn rootworms, right? We already have field resistance to one strain of BT corn out in the environment. We have selected for re uh, BT resistance in the laboratory took about three generations. Insecticides are this going to be the same story. We need to take a step back here, guys. We need to not be reacting 
using the same failed strategies over and over and over again to support a system that's broken to begin with. We need to take a step back and we need to figure out what is it that's causing these pest problems to begin with rather than reacting to them. So I am a predator ecologist. I landed in Brookings, South Dakota USDA ARS lab, which is the corn rootworm lab. Been researching corn rootworms for 30, 40 years. Um, I figured, being a predator ecologist, I would start studying the predator, er, the predator uh, community of corn rootworms. I'll just pick up where everybody else has left off. This is obviously an important issue given the, the scale and scope of the pest and the fact that only 1% of eggs or less than 1% of eggs from, uh, that actually turn into adults, most of them die in the soil. Something's got to be killing these things, right? There had been no concerted efforts to try to identify what biotic mortality factors were affecting corn rootworms in their field conditions. A little bit of work had been done at our laboratory maybe 20 years ago, but it was, it was cursory to, to, to say the least. We had to start from scratch. How do you study a predator community to know even what's out there possibly eating cor or corn rootworms that you could tap into as a source of management for this pest? Well, we had to develop some new technologies. Insect predators, for all their benefits, are pretty stupid. If there's a hole in the ground or a barrier, they run into the barrier and they turn left or right and then they fall in the holes. So we were able to use pitfall trapping to monitor the seasonal occurrence of predators that might be associated with different life stages of the pest. Now a colleague of mine who's now since retired came up with this bad boy. This is a rotating pitfall trap. So every three hours it changes so that we're able to study not only when predators are available out over the season, but also when they're active over a 24-hour period. Now, insects that fall into these things, especially predators, end up eating everything else that's in the pitfall trap, so you have to kill them, right? So we have to put in a, 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 a fluid that doesn't evaporate. We use antifreeze. Antifreeze has the added benefit of preserving DNA. So, what we have is we had about 1,500 predators, all that had these wonderful stomachs that were filled with their last meals before falling into the antifreeze. We developed a genetic technique that we could search the stomachs of these predators and identify not only which had been eating corn rootworm DNA but how much of it they had consumed. So not only do we have the technologies now to track the predator community but we can actually identify exactly which proportion has been eating corn rootworms under field conditions. What did we find? Well, the gut analysis revealed, uh, diabrotica is corn rootworms, by the way, um, a very diverse predator community. This would include things like carabid beetles. There's another one. These are the little black beetles that are scurrying about on the soil surface. Uh, spiders, harvestmen, ants, mites, crickets. All of these things were eating corn rootworms under the field conditions. At the, in this initial study, we published 17 different predator groups that were testing positive. Now I think we're up to around 40 or 50. And 11% of this population was positive for pest DNA. Ah, geez, Jen, 11%. I'm really sorry about that. That's not very much. Well, actually, I was really, really pleased when I saw this number, and that's because you have to understand what we're really measuring here. As soon as an insect eats, eats a meal, it instantly starts to digest its di or it, it, this food, right? The DNA is only detectable for around maybe eight hours or so. That means that 11% of our predator population had eaten corn rootworms in the last eight hours. 
The other thing to remember is 11% of 1,500, eh, that's like, yeah, what, 150, 160 predators. That's not very much. But when you're starting to think about, well, <laughs> our actual density samples uh, suggest 100 million predators per acre in the soil, possibly up to a billion predators per acre in the soil at Dakota Lakes Research Farm. 11% in the last eight hours, that's a lot of predation going on. When I first embarked on this project, most of the corn rootworm biologists dismissed it. There are no rootworm natural enemies. Well, we're proving them wrong. All right. So this is a really noisy graph. Um, this is the over the season. Um, this is how they used to measure date back in Caesar's time, I guess. I don't know, Julian date. Uh, we have when those pests were available. Each of these instars are life stages of the larvae. This is when the predators are, 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 are out and walking around. What are these predators? Carabid, carabid beetle, a rove beetle, wolf spider, carabid, wolf spider, carabid, carabid, mites, little money penny spiders, carabid, crickets, field crickets. These are not something to stomp on. Even when they come in your house, these are benefit, beneficial. Another mite, carabid, spiders, and then harvestmen. The point of this graph is to show you that each of these rootworm life stages succumbs to a very different predator community over the season. This is a dynamic community. It changes as the season goes on. It also changes over a 24-hour period. We have some that are nocturnal. These are all those predator species. This is the time of day when they're out walking around. These are the day active species of predators. Some of them are around all the time. Crickets again. Some of them walk around only during a three hour period of each day. So these very complex predator communities are structuring themselves so that they're not running into each other all the time in ways that they, these really diverse and abundant communities can, can persist in the environment. What does this mean? Well, when we're talking about predator populations, these can be managed in such a way by using things like, like cover crops or, or, or soil primers that Paul was just talking about to encourage these predator communities to become more abundant. Here we have a cover crop preceding corn versus bare soil preceding corn, and these are the predator populations that we were finding. This is root ratings. This is root damage caused by the pest. Root damage goes down as the number of rootworms that are killed goes by predators goes up. Predators are driving these, uh, these interactions and we can manage these predator communities using things like biodiversity. All right. So, diverse predator communities reside in cropland, right? I think we've demonstrated that. This is just kind of the first step in the project. We're trying to figure out which predators out of all of these different species that we can find in a cornfield are the ones that we need to be conserving. Which of these are the most important? Well, that's a really difficult question to answer because these communities are so dynamic. If we're targeting just one pest, we're ignoring all of the other potential services that these things could be consuming, or that these things could be contributing as well. These communities change. Only some predators eat a particular target pest. Others might specialize on aphids. Others might specialize still on European corn borers. So what we really need to be thinking about is we need to take a step back instead of trying to look for a magic bullet. We need to be trying to tailor our conservation effort at communities, not individual species. And recognizing that we're getting there, but we're still not there yet in understanding all of the different interactions of these communities that may drive, say, successful biological control. This is not accomplished by individual species. This is accomplished by the interactions produced by communities. All right, 
So many, some of you guys have seen that part of the talk before. This is something that I have not shown before. This is an idea that is kind of coming on strong with a lot of the ecologists, applied ecologists like myself. Weeds. Can we manage weed seeds using insects? Insects love to eat weed seeds. Seeds within cropland, weeds within cropland are what we consider seed limited. That means that the populations of weeds are regulated by how many seeds survive to adulthood. So if we can reduce the number of seeds that are in cropland, we can potentially control when and where weeds are going to become abundant. This is work that only really being done, there's a guy in Michigan, there's a guy in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Iowa, and then our group. So this is, but we're getting some really interesting results that I think we can really start thinking about how to, or, uh, how to conserve insect communities as seed predators as part of a more integrated weed management system. All right, seeds. Two things you need to take away. Seeds are abundant, seeds are nutritious. By abundant, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of seeds in every meter squared. In cropland, in the desert, and these aren't even the most productive habitats in terms of biomass that are out there, or plant diversity. Tons of seeds are produced. Seeds are very nutritious. Last time I looked, Humans were not out there eating the foliage of soybeans or if the foliage of wheat plants were eating the seeds. Humans have figured out that seeds are nutritious. Insects in some ways are more intelligent and have nevertheless and, and have therefore figured out that the seeds are also nutritious. I went through the literature in this book I wrote and I calculated, I tried to figure out what the nutritional content of insect prey was versus the nutritional content of seeds from the literature. Each of these numbers is the number of studies that actually looked at this or uh, that are published. And I found that in almost all of these categories, calories, protein content, lipid content or fats, and then carbs, seeds were either nutritionally superior to insect prey or equal in the case of protein content. Seeds are incredibly nutritious, and it's not surprising, therefore, that insects have tried to figure out ways to incorporate these things into their diets. So which insects are we talking about here? Well, this is a soil health conference. I'm talking about the insects that are post-dispersal granivores, which is to say those insects that specialize on the seeds after they've fallen into the out from the plant and onto the ground. Most of the published work on these systems, and there's been a trickle of literature over the last 20 years, 30 years or so, suggests that ground beetles, ants, and crickets are the primary, in addition to rodents, are the primary granivores in most systems. The reason that these are the most important is because these are the groups, and I'm guilty as charged, uh, that entomologists really like to study. <laughs> so this is actually probably a bias in the literature because carabid biologists, figured out that carabids like to eat weed seeds and so we study them. In reality, we have no idea what insects are out there consuming weed seed uh, communities in the natural environment. This is something that I thought was a, a major oversight and I wanted to correct it. So, step one in a conservation project is identify who the key players are. We cannot use DNA like I did with the corn rootworms in this instance because a plant the foliage of a plant has the same DNA as the seed of a plant. And so we need a seed specific marker. Something that will tell us if we find it in the stomach of an insect that it can only have come from the seed. We used a, a buddy of mine down in uh, Arizona, he works with USDA ARS, uh, developed this protein marking technology. Essentially you put a protein 
onto your food item that does not normally exist in the natural environment. In our case, we used rabbit immunoglobulin G, which is the blood, uh, it's a component of the blood of rabbits, which sounds, yeah, really awful when I put it that way. Uh, so we actually put nanogram qu quantities of this marker, this protein on, our, on these seeds, these in, in this case are dandelion seeds. Then you put the seeds out into the habitat, you collect insects, yank out their stomachs just like we did before, and then you run an ELISA, which is an enzyme-linked immunosorbin assay. Uh, the reason, okay, the ELISAs are a very common uh, uh, diagnostic. Um, uh, rabbit IgG, why would we use rabbit blood? Well, that's because uh, the medical field uses this technology a lot. So you can get rabbit IgG, you can, you can get this, for those of you interested, can get rabbit component of blood uh, uh, very cheaply uh, from, from a chemical company. Um, and, and so the ELISAs are really well developed for this protein. Um, ELISA sounds like a big sexy thing. Uh, this is something that actually we use in human society all the time. Uh, one example you may or may not have experience with is uh, pregnancy tests are in ELISA. Uh, so you can kind of think of this as a, as a pregnancy test. To, yeah, I, I don't think I'll even go there. Uh, okay, so we took these seeds. We put them out into a nice dandelion habitat. Um, many of you know dandelions. Uh, this is a beautiful spring flower that everybody appreciates for its... Now this is a weed, uh, very common weed in uh, lawns and gardens as well as in no-till cropping areas. Nevertheless, it's a, actually a really important floral resource for a lot of insects as well. Uh, this is a, a native to Europe. Um, it, we think it's actually a very complicated situation uh, with the taxonomy of this thing because it is now worldwide. Um, it, why I chose dandelion is because in Europe, where it's native to, some friends of mine at the Czech Republic have gone through great lengths to try to describe the granivore community. And so I thought, well, w although we have no knowledge of what the granivore community is in the United States, it might be nice to partner up with them uh, to try to take advantage of their experience in this system. So. We collected insects from this habitat that we put these marked seeds out into, and this is what we found. We collected about almost 2,000 specimens from 65 different species, just near Brookings, South Dakota. Um, and what we found is, yes, the usual suspects were there, and these were important. These were things like carabid beetles and ants and crickets, right? But the seed predator community, because we're using this new technology, is so much more diverse than we e ever realized. The most abundant, or the most important seed predators are probably things like isopods, roly polies. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a second. Millipedes, caterpillars, weevils. These weren't even on the radar screen as potential granivores. And 22% of specimens ate these seeds within the last eight hours of them being collected. That's a lot of predation going on. Of these, the top five most frequent consumers, again, millipedes. These are something you guys all recognize. They walk around in my basement. Uh, small crickets. Uh, isopods, these little roly polies. Gorillus pensylvanicus, that's one of my faves. He's uh, the black field cricket. And then uh, these little crabid beetles, Anisodactylus rusticus, were the most frequent consumers of dandelion seeds. It gets more complicated, right? Weeds are managed as a community, not as an individual species. And insects have very distinctive preferences for each of these different weed species so that the top five consumers of dandelion seeds may be very different than the top cons five consumers of, say, crabgrass or, or, or red root pigweed or something along these lines. So here we have Gorillus pensylvanicus and their seed, the number of seeds that they consume in the laboratory. Crabgrass, by far and away, their fave. 
The, uh, the carabid beetle here, they're top consumers of things like lamb's quarter, these small dicot seeds, dicotyledonous seeds. Seeds vary in their nutrition, their defense, their size and structures, and these dictate which insects are going to be their more, or are going to specialize on these, pre, on these, on these seeds. So, the question that was posed earlier about which insects predators to conser conserve to control corn rollworms, the same conclusion kind of starts to come to the forefront of how we should be managing weed seeds using insects. Seeds vary in their nutrition and their defense, and granivores vary in their preferences for seeds. We need to be tailing our conservation efforts at, once again, communities rather than individuals being done gets even more complicated because we're dealing, when we're talking about insect pest suppression and weed, uh, weed consumption, seed consumption, we're dealing with the same insect species a lot of times. Our decision to manage one service cannot come at the expense of all of these other services that they provide. This begs the question of how does do these omnivorous, <laughs> what we're classifying now as omnivorous natural enemies, balance their foraging efforts against things like seeds versus insect prey. Nobody's ever really looked at this before with seed predator, predator communities. Does the availability of one class of food, say insect prey, affect the biological control of another class? Insect, uh, many of these insects are, are best described as omnivores. All right, so the central question here, how, when we mimic uh, the local seed rain of a weed, how does that affect the local insect community, both in their abundance and in their foraging decisions? And we just got this published. It took a long time, oddly enough. We did this experiment over two years in alfalfa. We used our, our weed seed species that we decided to focus on was, uh, was foxtail. Um, a green foxtail uh, in this particular case. Uh, we've set up these little patches within these alfalfa fields to try to mimic, okay, what if a couple of foxtail seeds suddenly, or foxtail plants suddenly got away from you and started tossing out seeds. And then we also put out some seed dishes that, uh, that we could then monitor how many seeds are removed over time. And then we monitor the insect populations using these barrier linked pitfall traps again. And then we checked them uh, about three times a day. Um, we collected only the crickets and carabids because at the time of this experiment, I didn't realize just how diverse this community was. We focused on the usual suspects. And we tore the stomachs out of, gosh, I do this a lot. We tore the stomachs out of these poor guys too. But instead of using any fancy dancy uh, molecular techniques, we just looked under the microscope. And you can generally, we focus mostly on the crickets, which were our dominant species in the system, and which are really important predators and seed consumers in these systems. And um, we dissected them out and we looked for um, plant material or prey. So you can usually detect, just using the microscope, whether there's plant cells in there or whether there's insect cuticle. All right. 23 species were collected, 5,000 insects in 2008, only 900 in, in 2007. Interesting point to point out here, uh, we uh, saw about 6% of the seeds were removed from those seed dishes per day in 07 and 1% per day um, in 2008. This doesn't seem like a lot until you start thinking about a growing season of 180 days in which case that's a lot of seed removal going on. Insect communities were very similar in the, in the plots that saw seeds versus the plots that didn't see seeds. That means that the insect communities did not aggregate, they didn't move to try to get these, thing, these seeds resources. These insects that we're dealing with are happily like biding their time. Most of these insects were granivores. This is what happened, but what's ha interesting is that they will change their diet in response to these local seed resources. Such 
but this does not come at the expense of their prey consumption. 70% of crickets had eaten insect prey within the last few hours of being caught. Under, and this was true in both the seed treatment and in the control treatment. Um, but what was interesting is that when seeds became available, they expanded their diet to incorporate these seeds. All right, what does that mean? Let me try to give you a picture here. Okay, so these insects are sitting there in this alfalfa field. They're big, there's, they're hungry. And, and so they're not necessarily going to uh, uh, move around in the alfalfa field just because there's weed seeds available, but man, if they find it, they're ready to strike. This is a very important trait of biological control agents. This is something that we really wanted to see. And we can rely, therefore, on, pre on these insects as both predators and granivores. All right. So I'll wrap this up so that we can all start eating lunch here. I'm wondering, I'm doing okay on time. All this talk about food. I think we should take a straw poll as far as who's more carnivorous and more granivorous at lunch today. Um, no, we shouldn't. Okay, uh, so conclusions. Insects have a really important role to play in crop management. These things cr contribute all kinds of services, not just pest management services. I mean, a lot of the crops that we grow are pollinated by insects. They also help to recycle nutrients back into the soil. They open pores into the soil so that water can get in there. However, the community functions are extremely complex and difficult to predict. I think I illustrated that. I hope I illustrated that pretty well with those two examples of weed seed predation and insect predation. What we need is rather than looking at our farmland as something that we need to jump into and control, we need to have some respect for Mother Nature. We need a humbler approach to pest management. We need to understand what's going on in the natural environment. And I sound like a broken record from what's been said earlier in this talk, or in, the, in, these, in, the, in this morning's presentations. We need to understand the ecological processes that we are stripping from our cropland that normally regulate things like insect pest populations and weed populations and pathogens too. And we need to figure out what are the processes that are occurring in natural systems that make these not so problematic in natural systems and we need to get those processes back into cropland. In this way, we're going to alleviate the problems of pests before they even occur rather than getting on this pesticide treadmill that we're currently experiencing. We often think, it's easy to think, I'm a farmer or a land manager, this is somebody else's problem. This is, uh, this is the people that manage natural areas or, or, or the rainforest. This isn't, my, this isn't my gig. 25 to 40 percent of the terrestrial land surface on our planet is devoted to agroecosystems, guys. If, if we are not incorporated, this makes agroecosystems the largest biome on the planet Earth. If we are not involving farmers in, uh, in these decisions on how to conserve our soil resources and everything that they provide to us, then we're missing a really important opportunity. And events like this, this morning, really uh, give me inspiration that I think we can get there in the not too distant future. So many, 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 many people helped out with all of this research that I presented here. Um, and, and I don't know if I've got time or not for questions, but, or whether we just want to go and eat. That's all I got. All right. Questions, rotten fruit, vegetables that you'd like to throw? Yes. system that you're 
talking about economically. Yes. They're moving one year from one year to God on the bank side to try to survive. This is a long term commitment. The central themes that we need to be replacing into our cropland are we need to be increasing diversity and we need to be reducing disturbance. There are agronomic practices that are profitable that we can use in order to do that. And I think we've touched on some of those this morning. At least I hope that we have, and probably more so this afternoon. Um, things like going no-till. Things like, things like incorporating cover crops, rotating your crops to incorporate more crop diversity in and around your farm. Managing field margins so that we're getting diversity back onto our farms. These are critical things that we can do that have proven agronomic benefits not everybody is going to be able. Uh, not everybody is going to be uh, just jump right into a Gail Fuller or a, or a, or a Gabe Brown or a, or a Dave Brandt scenario in year one. Uh, there are things that you can use to transition that, and I guess I would support doing that as much as you can. Uh, as far as insects eating weed seeds, what happens when you run out of weed seeds? <laughs> then hopefully they eat your insect prey. Uh, one thing about weed seeds is, I mean, they, do, they just don't seem to run out. <laughs> there always seems to be a few more. And using insects solely as, as the sole management of weeds, I mean, I'm the first to admit, we're not there yet, guys. Uh, but this is going to be a really important component of things like um, what Randy Anderson is doing or Matt Liebman is doing down in Iowa, where we're diversifying our rotations out. We need to be understanding why is it that these more diverse rotations are eliminating our herbicide costs. And one of the reasons, I think, is because these granivores are able to come in and take advantage of that. In, in a simple, simple complex, um, single crop rotation, how are we going to get the better genetics for the corn and soybean and so forth that we're going to see when uh, economically we're going to sell you BT and so forth? And second, you could even see grass up rates. Wait, no, don't throw that away. Or don't give that away. Say your first question again. Okay. Simply, corn seed. I cannot buy the best genetics of corn seed unless I buy a BT, a uh, Brown of Ready, a Liberty League, yada, right. yada, yada. Good question. Yeah, that is a very good question. You need to start, we need to start asking, okay, so the question is, is okay, the best genetics tend to be in the most expensive, or the, the, one, or the, the best genetics of the crop tends to be in the crop that has a lot of the traits and the, and the, and the ad, uh, additions to them, like seed treatments and whatnot. How can you get the best genetics without all of the extras is a, is a really important question. Um, I believe that we are, uh, especially after going down to Salina last year and seeing some of the seed dealers that are down there, there is a growing market now for non-GM seeds that is growing. Um, it, we need to be investing in these places again. Um, they've, a lot of these uh, smaller seed companies have been driven out of business by um, some of the larger seed companies that have um, the seed traits. As the market develops, as farmers start asking for these things, ask for the best genetics, hold the seed treatments. Um, it isn't going to be overnight though. And, and developing a relationship with the seed dealers, I think, is going to be really important. Um, your second question is, do cr crickets eat grasshopper eggs? There are many things that eat grasshopper eggs. Crickets are probably one of them. I know of no specific examples of this because we're just starting to understand cricket feeding behavior. But there is a predator community that does uh, blister beetles eat grasshopper eggs. They're actually specialists on grasshopper eggs. So if you've got blister beetles around your farm, hopefully they're not getting into your hay because it could act, they, they have a, well, 
that's a long story. They, they, they produce a toxin that's actually an aphrodisiac mm, uh, that, uh, that hurts horses, cantharidin. Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, it's strong. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. We do elaborate on, uh, there are certain crops uh, in any given year that have higher infestations of insect pests and they seem to devour certain fields. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on how insects hone in on those fields and for what particular reason they hone in on a certain field? Okay, so oftentimes insects that affect cropland, and there are exceptions, things like grasshoppers, especially that affect you guys around this part of the country, that are generalists. But for the most part, a lot of our specialists, or our pests of crops, the most important pests of crops, are specialists on that crop. They are looking for large, large monocultures of a particular species Nature is trying to reset the balance, and they send in the herbivores to reset that balance. You often do not see large monocultures within natural systems. Herbivores keep those, keep those monocultures from occurring. We go out and we plant a, a single species, often with very little genetic diversity of that particular crop, on huge acres, and then not surprisingly, because we've also often tilled the heck out of it and, and, and not used any cover crops or something like this, we have set up a, a perfect scenario for the specialist pests to go crazy. Their natural enemies are not in that field. And so um, this is really something that, uh, that, that uh, is driving a lot of what you're, I think, talking about back there. Um, why is it that we see these outbreaks of specific pests in a particular field? It's because we've eliminated a lot of the biotic resistance that would stop those pests from getting there to begin with. Nailed. Good. <laughs> question. Quick question. Uh, we've been driven in the agricultural field to use the strongest chemical on our crops. Yes. That is a great question, and we are actually studying that very question. Um, we are, through the overuse of glyphosate in the United States of America, we have uh, selected for um, a weed community that is now resistant to glyphosate. We have changed what weeds are most abundant in that community and because insect communities, beneficial insect communities, are often um, tied to specific plants that are in the environment or in a habitat, we are therefore having this, this uh, I would say, trickle up effect on all of these higher trophic levels. So we are reshaping the insect communities that are occurring within our crop plan. Um, what are the long-term implications of this? I don't know, but uh, the answer that we are getting um, from um, conventional weed management approaches is more of the same. They are going to replace glyphosate-tolerant crops with um, uh, 2,4-D-resistant crops or dicamba-resistant crops. If you guys have not started to look into this, and, and, and see what the literature says about this, you should start because glyphosate is a really unique chemistry. It, it actually, amongst herbicides, this stuff is fairly tame. If we go back to the days of 2,4-D and, and dicamba, and we start applying this on most of the, of the, <laughs> of the terrestrial land surface of our country, <sighs> Look into it. One last question. Time for one more. All right. Thank you.